video, we're looking at the inference procedure devoted to comparing two population means um, when small sample sizes are present. So we've done this before with the large sample sizes. With large sample sizes, we can assume normality. With small sample sizes, we're unable to assume normality. So in other words, x bar 1 and x bar 2 of the sample sizes for both of those uh, groups that we derive the x bars from, if they're both over 30, we can let the central limit theorem kick in and let us assume that the populations are um, at least approximately normal. So you know, x bar 1 and x bar 2, if they're approximately normal, their differences are approximately normal, which means the point estimator we use in this inference procedure is approximately normal, and we can assume the bell curve applies. However, when the sample sizes are small, of course, we can't necessarily safely assume that. It turns out that's not quite as important as the next issue that comes up, which is that um, the standard deviation, the sample standard deviations that we use as estimates of their population counterparts, sigma 1 and sigma 2, it turns out that these guys are not as good as estimators of their population counterparts when the sample size is small. So that means that in order to compensate for that weakness, we use the t-distribution to make up for that. So in this case, um, that's going to be kind of the bigger issue that we have to worry about. So it turns out this procedure overall is pretty robust. Um, even if the populations don't deviate from normality too much, the procedure works pretty well. But um, this issue is always there. So if the sample sizes are small, we still have to be concerned with that. So in that case, we're going to use the t-distribution to compensate for that. So basically, the punchline here is that the small sample size problem relies on the t-distribution. However, if that was all there was to it, great, you know, we just move on and get on with our lives and, and do the problems, and great, mechanically there wouldn't be much difference between them. However, it turns out there's another issue that comes up then. If we're going to use the t-distribution approach, then we have to be concerned with whether these guys are in fact equal or whether they are different. If they are different, it turns out that the distribution of our, um, our point estimator will not be exactly a t-distribution, which means we'll have to approximate its distribution. Now that's kind of difficult. So if we assume the population standard deviations from the two groups that we're looking at, if they're assumed to be different, then we have to use an approximation technique. So we only have an approximate t distribution in that situation. If, however, the two items are exactly the same and they're assumed to be equal, equal variance or equal standard deviation is assumed in the problem, then we're going to use the t distribution and the distribution of our point estimator is going to be exactly a t distribution. So um, that's what we're going to be talking about in, in the next uh, phase of this, is whether we assume equal population variances or standard deviations, or whether we don't assume that. If we don't assume that, then we have to go ahead and use an approximation approach. So let's look at the easier scenario, the first scenario, where they're assumed to be the same. Um, so examples where you might assume that they're the same is, um, let's say you're looking at the variation between test scores for males and females. Uh, it might be that um, the variation between those two groups is the same. So we can go ahead and compare their means safely and assume that their standard deviations are actually equal to one another. If that were the case, let's talk about how you do a confidence interval to make that comparison. So we already learned how to do the confidence interval procedure for this type of problem, but now we're going to be looking at it with the t distribution. Okay, so in the first step of the problem, we're going to be getting the data, right? So for these problems, we're forming a confidence interval. The data step will be, you know, like it was before. We'll have a sample size, a sample mean, a standard deviation, right? We'll have a confidence level and an alpha that results from that, right? And then, of course, we'll have another population um, that we sampled. So we'll have a sample size from that group. We'll have a sample mean from that, and we'll have a standard deviation from that as well. So those are the items that we'll get. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different items we'll collect from the problem at that point. Then we'll have step two. Step two is normally where we get our table value. It used to be a critical z, but now we'll be working with the t distribution, so we'll be using t alpha divided by two here in this step. The key thing here, though, is to remember that t values have degrees of freedom. In order to figure out what this degree of freedom is, it's actually going to be n1 plus n2 minus 2. So it's kind of the sum of the two individual degrees of freedom. Right? For this population, its degrees of freedom will be n minus 1. For this one, it will be n minus 1. Right? So n1 minus 1, n2 minus 1, if you added those together, you actually get this quantity. Right? So that's the step 2, getting your critical table t value. Now in step 3, we have to calculate the margin of error. Now the margin of error is what really changes here a little bit. And the formula you know, is t alpha divided by 2, so we always have the table value multiplied by the standard error. 
And so if you're assuming that the, the two populations have the same standard deviation or the same variance, then what you're actually put here is this quantity, sp squared over n1 plus sp squared over n2. So it's very similar to the formula we had before, except where we used to have s1 squared, you know, s2 squared over n1 and n2 added together. We've changed that now. We put this quantity sp. So the question is, what's sp? Well, sp is the pool estimator of this common population standard deviation. So remember, we assume that these s1s and s2s were estimators of a population standard deviation. They're actually, in fact, the same, right? We're assuming that the same variation, the same standard deviation. So this sp is the pooled estimator. And all that means is we're going to do like a weighted average of these two quantities. So we're going to take them and sort of do a weighted average. And weighted average means we're going to put into consideration their sample size and so on. So, you know, getting away from all that, just let's get to the formula. The formula is basically going to be this. It'll be S squared sub P, and you're going to have N1 minus 1 times S1 squared plus N2 minus 1 times S2 squared, all divided by N1 plus N2 minus 2. So that's basically the formula for this pooled estimator of your population variance. Okay, and that's because you're assuming equal variances or equal population standard deviations. All right, so, you know, the formula changes a little bit. It's not too much work there, but that's it. And then we go to the final step, of course, which doesn't really change at all. It essentially is same as before, x1, x bar 1 minus x bar 2 minus the error, and then, of course, the same quantity, x bar 1 minus x bar 2 plus the error. And that's it. Okay, so that's your overall confidence interval procedure, assuming that you have equal variances, and assuming your sample sizes are small, right? One of these is below 50.